Describe the purpose and how you and others developed and implemented the Registered Play Therapist, or RPT, and Registered Play Therapist Supervisor, RPTS, credentialing program. Well, as most people know, the Association for Play Therapy is a very diverse group of professionals. And we have really liked to cherish that and honor that. So when the association first started, we had so many people coming from so many professional fields that we wanted to make sure that there was some common body of knowledge among them all, and they um, all met you know, certain criteria. So unlike a lot of other organizations who only allow people with a certain degree in a certain discipline, we have uh, nurses, psychiatrists, social workers, counselors, psychologists, all types of people in the organization which I think leads to its strength, but it also led to us thinking we need to develop some kind of credentialing process because we're delivering services to clients and we want to make certain that we're giving them quality services. Do you recall why APT chose to formally designate approved providers of play therapy continuing education programs rather than simply accept the training certificates issued by other educational organizations? Well, I think even today there's a lot of confusion about what is play therapy. I was giving a speech one time in Utah and the waiter asked me why I was there. And so I told him about play therapy. He said, oh, I know what that is. It's when you watch a play and you talk about it afterwards. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not exactly it. And so there are uh, educators, university professors, who really didn't understand that much about uh, play therapy. And so we wanted to make sure that there was some quality check that everybody kind of knew what really play therapy was and weren't mistaking it for, for example, recreational therapy, occupational therapy, or just play in general. So to make sure that training centers were training actual play therapy, we decided to set some criteria for that. Why and under what conditions do you believe that play therapy can be effective with adolescents, adults, and seniors? Well, I've written a number of things on, on this topic, and when we were defining what is play therapy when I was on the board, I really lobbied for us saying that it's delivering services to clients, not just children, because I see a lot of applicability of play therapy to um, adolescents, adults, and seniors. They have some of the same concerns that children have and some of the same limitations in terms of expressing them. And so uh, play therapy approaches can work really effectively with them. Several years ago, my youngest client in my own private practice was two years, nine months old, and my oldest was 85. And I was using play therapy with everyone. The conditions under which I think play therapy is particularly helpful for adolescents, adults, and seniors are times when they present with a lot of resistance, particularly adolescents, or I'm not talking to you, I'm not looking at you, and I usually then switch to play therapy. They think they're not cooperating with me, but meanwhile I'm learning a lot. Um, or secondly, times when uh, this population of clients are in denial, and so if they don't admit the problem, it's hard to talk about it if they don't admit it, but they will often discuss it symbolically through drawing, through uh, game play, you know, and, and so forth. Um, thirdly, there are a lot of, uh, just as children, adolescents, adults, and, and seniors who come to therapy being psychologically unaware of what's causing these problems. And so if they're not aware of the cause, it's hard for them to articulate it. So through the symbolism of play, we're able to find out what their concerns are and then uh, implement a treatment. Uh, fourthly, there are clients who come who really have difficulty articulating their feelings. And so they could have uh, alexithemia, for example, or just other reasons that it's very hard for them to express their feelings. And through play therapy, we can help this population. There's this, a really a great need among seniors who have you know, a lot of you know, their own um, issues and concerns, and there's a lot of good play therapy material out there now for senior citizens. 
Describe how graduate play therapy courses came to be offered by nearly 170, or 18 percent, of regionally accredited universities in the United States. Play therapy courses came to be recognized and taught by so many universities because I think more and more professional people were realizing the value of play and they understood more about play therapy. And so I've seen this organization grow from a population of about 300 to over 5,000 now. It's exciting to see that growth and so more and, and more people are realizing the value of play therapy and I think more and more universities thought uh, it would behoove them to offer, offer, offer courses in this area. Is technology influencing play therapy? If yes, how? Technology, I think, is influencing play therapy like anything else in a positive way and a negative way. Uh, technology is influence, influencing play therapy in as much as a lot of children are not playing games outside anymore. They're not playing with each other. Consequently, they're not learning executive functioning skills, they're not learning social skills, so they have social skills like deficits. So in that way, technology has had a negative effect on child development, but an increase in demand for play therapy interventions. On the other hand, there's some good play therapy interventions using technology, so I think the influence of technology has both positive and negative aspects. Provide three or four bits of wisdom with new play therapists or play therapy educators. First of all, I guess know yourself. Um, know kind of what's really going on with you as it influences your choice of play, your interaction uh, with the client, the, your treatment choices, you know, and so forth. So I, th I think that's like really important. Um, also, uh, make sure you get like a lot of training. I think the more training you get, the more competent you become. And thirdly, I guess I would say um, develop a professional support network uh, because you can learn a lot from other people who maybe had like similar cases and um, therefore they support you and you share knowledge and when you feel frustrated or really stuck about something, they can help you a lot too. From the perspective of both a member and a former board member, share your observations about the evolution of APT. I do agree with the direction the organization is going um, today because I think it incorporates all those elements of embracing different theories of play therapy, trying to learn more about what we still don't know, also um, applying play therapy to all different like age ranges and using a multiplicity of like treatment approaches. I really like the fact that we are so diverse in our membership because I think that only enhances our professional development. Tell us about the APT Journal and how it got started. In 1992 we started the uh, International Journal of Play Therapy and we started it as a peer-reviewed journal to reach out to um, people who have scholarly interest in play therapy. So the purpose is to just inform people more about play therapy, um, its effectiveness, about research studies, about um, treatment interventions, and as such, it, it reaches a wide population of individuals, particularly um, university professors who would be interested in the kinds of articles that would be in a journal, but also practitioners because we have articles in the journal about uh, certain uh, interventions that uh, practitioners have used. And I think as such, um, it has really helped lots of individuals across the world really learn more about play therapy and its effectiveness. What should be the major focus of the play therapy community over both the near and long-term future? I think we have to put a focus on research because um, that's very important in terms of uh, showing people our effectiveness, but we shouldn't lose track of the art of play therapy and you know, also there's a certain art of play therapy and a certain science of, of play therapy. I think it's important to network with other professionals outside of mental health such as um, physicians, um, you know, developmental 
uh, psychologists, you know, and so forth, um, neuroscientists, because all these things have impact, you know, on our work. And although we do have a lot of play therapists in other countries, I think it, it's important for us to continue to encourage and support people in other countries to do play therapy because there certainly is a need in other parts of the world too. What metaphor would you use to define the field of play therapy over the last few decades? Well, the metaphor I would use to describe play therapy over the past few decades I think would have to be illustrated by a puppet, of course, since I'm a play therapy. So I like to think of play therapy as I saw it in the, when I was first acquainted with play therapy in the 60s, um, compared to now as sort of like this puppet who starts out being a caterpillar. And I think that's how kind of play therapy was. It was good. There was kind of like nothing wrong with it. But since we have done you know, more and more research and we've educated more and more people about play therapy and um, we have outcome studies of effectiveness and so forth, I think we really have changed into um, a beautiful butterfly in as much as um, we're a lot more well known, accepted, um, and um, effective like in our approaches. So I think um, we're flying lots of places now.